Stephen Greenblatt is here. He is a literary critic and Shakespeare scholar who teaches at Harvard. His biography of the bard Will in the World topped the New York Times bestseller list for nine weeks. His latest publication is Shakespeare's Montaigne. It examines William Shakespeare's debt to the French essayist Michel de Montaigne. I am pleased to have Stephen Greenblatt back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to uh, see you, John. So why did you write this? This is an uh, edition of the central part of this book is an edition of a particular translation of Montaigne that lets you look over Shakespeare's shoulder as he was reading Montaigne. The greatest French writer and the greatest English writer of the Renaissance encountered each other. Shakespeare read Montaigne in this translation. But never so you, met. No, never met. Uh, and uh, we can be absolutely sure that Montaigne never heard of Shakespeare. Right. Uh, but this is a magical, it's a wonderful translation and it's a magical opportunity uh, that a uh, colleague of mine, Peter Platt, and I saw to put together uh, once again these Florio essays that were central to Shakespeare, these translations of Montaigne's essays. And who was John Florio? John Florio was an interesting character, was uh, the son of a, uh, a uh, Protestant, uh, actually began his life as a Franciscan, Italian Franciscan, but he, he abandoned... The church became a Protestant, uh, fled to England, uh, and had a, a son, John Florio, in England. Uh, and after a series of complicated uh, moves in his life, this, the son went to Oxford um, and became a major figure in translation, uh, and not only for uh, Montaigne, but also for Italian uh, texts and Italian uh, sources. So uh, Shakespeare probably knew this man. Uh, may not have liked him, but may, it's hard to say, uh, Florio, but it was through Florio that not only Shakespeare, but virtually everyone in Shakespeare's time in England read Montaigne. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche said, Shakespeare was Montaigne's best reader. Well, it's an <laughs> extravagant thing to say, uh, but he was certainly a passionate reader of Montaigne. Uh, and a, there was some connection between them, a surprising connection, because, after all, they're also profoundly different, not only France and England, but an aristocrat, a uh, French aristocrat, and a middle-class English playwright aren't automatically soulmates. Mm. And, in fact, in many ways... One had that, a more commercial uh, sense than the other. Much more commercial. <laughs> had to make a living, yes. uh, which Montaigne... The other was of an aristocracy. Montaigne didn't have to make a living. He was a yeah. very wealthy man. Uh, although he, he was actually a very active man in politics and lots of other ways until he retired at 38 yes. uh, to write his essays. Uh, but uh, they did meet at... Uh, Shakespeare met Montaigne at a deep level. Uh, and Nietzsche, to that extent, is right that... They shared skepticism. They shared a wariness about uh, religious orthodoxy, about hypocrisy. Uh, they shared a deep sense of what the human predicament was, what it meant to face the serious issues of life and death. Tell us more about Montaigne. Montaigne uh, was a remarkable man, the son uh, of a man who was already wealthy. His great-grandfather had made the family money uh, in the wine uh, trade, as uh, befits someone from Bordeaux. Yeah. Uh, Montaigne was the third son, so wasn't in line to uh, inherit either the title or the wealth, but his older two brothers uh, died young, and Montaigne found himself in this peculiar position of inheriting, uh, p being poised to inherit uh, the family uh, title, aristocratic title and the estate, the chateau. He himself was involved intensely in an incredibly difficult time in France. France was absolutely falling apart. It was in its, how should we say, Iraq moment right. uh, of bitter, murderous hatred between uh, the Protestants and the Catholics. Uh, Montaigne was a Catholic, but wanted to mediate, wanted to keep the peace uh, was a friend uh, of very important people in power on both the Catholic and Protestant sides and tried his best uh, to do something to quiet the bitterness in the and, country. And you first started to read Montaigne when? I came across Montaigne when I was 20. Uh, in, a, in, in fact, in this translation, I saw in England, yeah. I saw the translation because it was bound in a very beautiful the college that I was at at Cambridge. It had very beautiful leather binding that caught my attention, so it was not a serious interest, and I got hooked. 
Yeah. I got hooked because, as anyone who loves Montaigne knows, uh, he speaks directly to you and shows you everything about himself. He doesn't hold anything back. Someone said he teaches you how to live. He does teach you how to live, or he teaches you how he, in any case, felt he should live. And he doesn't preach to you that way, but he shows you what he did, what he grappled with. And, and he feels like he's in the room with you. And how pervasive is his influence? His influence uh, is intermittent in England, but it very powerfully influenced Francis Bacon, uh, Thomas Brown, other people in the 17th century, all through the 18th century. But in effect, Montaigne's influence extends beyond anything literary. Montaigne in invented for the modern world what it is to to be autobiographically frank, what it is yeah. to tell you about and what he likes out and dislikes. And pointing inconsistencies in, in his himself life and, and in the world, what he likes and dislikes, whether he has a taste for salads, whether he likes cantaloupe or not, uh, <laughs> what sex feels like for him, what he thinks about death, uh, yeah. what he worries about, uh, doesn't worry about. Uh, he's completely... Uh, as far as he could. He said he'd like to go all the way. He'd like to portray himself naked, but he's not allowed. Yeah. But he goes as far as he can. Now, why was he that way? Uh, it's hard to say, Charlie. I mean, it certainly helped. It reminds me of some journalist I know. It's, uh, well, <laughs> I don't... It, the funny thing about it is that he, for a man who is in some sense obviously willing to show everything, he also... I think he wanted to... He had the incredible idea, which gradually developed in him that he could reproduce himself as it were clonally reproduce oh. himself make himself into a book that he would survive death by being completely here in these words and in these yeah. pages i think that he dreamt that he would actually survive uh, his disappearance which through he his understood, words through these words and he came as close i think as any human being has ever come to being actually physically in these little marks on the page. Yeah. You, you, you feel like he's there. He's there. He's there. And that's the opposite of Shakespeare, actually, in a curious way. The opposite strategy. Shakespeare was also worried about survival yeah. uh, and was interested in survival through words. But Shakespeare is the opposite type. Shakespeare is... We know almost nothing about Shakespeare, despite the fact that I wrote a biography about him. Uh, he's very <laughs> hidden. He conceals himself. He's yeah. not out there. Uh, and yet he did, in a different way, find a way of transforming himself into his characters, into other people whom you know, he invented. Montaigne helped him bring his characters alive. Montaigne enabled Shakespeare to figure out what it would sound like, I think, to be authentically who you are. But this is a completely different strategy. So I think, I think Montaigne used, I think Shakespeare used Montaigne, for example, in trying to create Hamlet, the character who is the most... Uh, out there of all of Shakespeare's characters, the most present. But it's, of course, not Shakespeare. It's a character called Hamlet, a Danish prince. But I think yeah. Shakespeare used Montaigne to do it. And, and, and how, do you, how do you prove that? Well, it's harder to prove it in the case of Hamlet. I mean, there are hints, uh, things you could take to be fingerprints, but people, Shakespeareans, are always trying to prove things that uh, are a little <laughs> implausible. But in the case of Montaigne, there are at least two moments yeah. in which... Uh, the fingerprints are very clear. King Lear is one. King Lear is one. An amazing moment in King Lear uh, in which uh, Shakespeare was clearly reading two essays by Montaigne, an essay of, about old age yeah. and an essay about the relationship of parents to their children. And in the, in the essay, a remarkable essay, both startling essays by Montaigne, a remarkable essay on the relation to parents to their children, Montaigne says... If a parent is young and vigorous, it's okay to hold on. But when a parent grows old, when a father begins to decline, and the son has come of age, the father should give basically everything to the son and reserve for himself just a little bit enough to go on, but, uh, but should not hold on and hold on and hold on, because Until holding on yeah. will, will, will spoil the chances of the young to have a career, that parents should give it away to their children. This was, of course, before uh, universities yeah. invented tuitions that made parents give it away to their children uh, at an early age. Uh, but in uh, yes. the concern uh, in Montaigne's world is what it means to hold on, and you should give it up. And Shakespeare quotes those words, but he gives the quotation, in effect, to the villain. 
of the play. Yeah. Uh, and a villain who says, I hope this is not just an essay, he says, uh, alluding <laughs> to the title of Montaigne's uh, words. I mean, it's a clear yeah. illusion. So one of the things that's fascinating there about that particular moment is that I think that Shakespeare must have regarded Montaigne as exceptionally naive about parents' chances of getting it back yeah. if things yeah. go wrong. Yeah. But maybe it's the result of being middle class and not an aristocrat. And you can also prove that uh, Montaigne influenced Shakespeare in The Tempest. He, that's another place in which there's very clearly uh, a clear fingerprint, an unmistakable fingerprint. Shakespeare, in that case, comes even closer to simply quoting Montaigne. But again, an odd thing happens, which is that he gives the quotation to a very charming, sweet, lovable, but but actually quite naive uh, aristocrat uh, who doesn't really understand anything about the natives. He, he gives uh, from Montaigne's great essay on the cannibals, yeah. the great essays about, of the encounter of the old world and the new, he gives basically lines describing ecstatically how wonderful America was, how wonderful the new world is. Yeah. And what, Mon what Shakespeare does is to give those lines to a character in a play that has a character who is, in effect, an anagram for cannibal, Caliban, yeah, yeah. who is anything but wonderful, who is debauched, yeah, right, uh, right, drunken, right, right, murderous. Right. So again, you, you can watch Shakespeare take someone he loved, I, someone he was influenced by, but actually turn it in a peculiar direction. Here's what you say. Shakespeare's borrowing is an act not of homage, but of aggression. Yes. <laughs> you have to... If you're going to swallow something, Charlie, even something you love, you have to chew it up and uh, break it down before you can swallow it. And I think that uh, the aggression is is a peculiar form. It's real aggression, but it's also oddly loving. Uh, it is even babies bite the nipple that they suck yeah, on. Uh, yeah, and yeah. the I think I think Shakespeare loved Montaigne, and I think he also. Uh, wanted to tear Montaigne in pieces, and I think that's true of Shakespeare's it, relation to a lot of about that. Was it simply a mind to mind thing, uh, or was there some jealousy on Shakespeare's part? Jealousy, perhaps not, but a very strong sense um, of here I am, a uh, middle class a fellow from Stratford, from a provincial town, who's trying to make his way in London, and I have to stain myself by performing in public uh, in the way that I do. Here is this aristocrat in a chateau, in a tower, who is communing uh, with the ancients, and who is brilliant, and who is deep. But this is not me. This is not who I am. So I think it's the meeting of two very different sensibilities. There are also there are some there are some fundamental similarities, deep similarities, deep ways in which they saw eye to eye. I think, especially in a way, the belief in the power of the everyday, the importance of living in the everyday, yeah. of understanding that that's what you have, not dreams yeah, about and the how afterlife. How is that present in Shakespeare? It's present in thousands of characters. Of of tiny touches in Shakespeare, as well as some grand touches, but uh, it's present in the sense that, in, in the grandest sense, in a, in a play like Romeo and Juliet, uh, that you don't have another world to look forward to. You have this world right now. This is it. Uh, there's nothing beyond this world. But it's also present in the innumerable ways in Shakespeare in which characters are touched by the ordinariness of life uh, of the of what it means when when Hal takes yes. stuff out of Falstaff's pockets and finds candy and receipts and the detritus of the everyday it's that eye that Shakespeare had for what it means to live an ordinary life in the midst of extraordinary events you wrote both were skilled at seizing upon anything that came their way in the course of wide-ranging reading or observation. Both prized the illumination of a brilliant perception over systematic thought. Both were masters of quotation and transformation. Both were supremely adaptable and variable. Both perceived and embraced the oscillations and contradictions within individuals 
equivocations and ironies and discontinu discontinuities, even in those who claim to be single-minded and single-hearted. Yes, they are both. Well, well said, sir. Thank you. They're both spectacular magpies, but there's a huge difference in one respect between them, at least in these regards. Sharing these things, Shakespeare believed in the power of stories. Montaigne believed in the experiment of just laying out without story, without narrative, without yeah. uh, just what it, what is passing through him. So basically, he said, "I don't need a play. I don't need a play. I don't need a story." Yeah. Uh, he didn't believe in tell stories. you what life is, but, means to me, and therefore you will understand what I think about the world. And Shakespeare says, I'll write a play, and you'll understand exactly. what I see about the world. I will create characters. I will make a story. You know, I will I'll craft all the contradictions something. of life through the conflicts between my characters. Exactly. Do you admire one more than the other? I admire Montaigne perhaps more than any writer I've ever encountered. That's, I, that's, a, that's a whole lot of sentences. He is an astonishing I human being. I more than any other writer I've ever encountered. He's an astonishing human being and a decent human being. Uh, but I think that Shakespeare's sense that Montaigne has an inadequately developed sense of evil uh, puts a finger at something that's in Shakespeare that's not uh, very at least visible in Montaigne. Montaigne knew that there was evil. He lived in evil times. But he didn't grapple in a way that Shakespeare grappled with uh, the most terrifying aspects of the human condition. What do you want to know about Shakespeare you don't know? I mean, one would like to know everything about right, Shakespeare, because you know, exactly. in fact, at this point, you know almost nothing. we know, certainly about, as a person, we know very, yeah. very little was about him. Was he a him. performer at the theater? He was. He was. We and but we don't know adequately what he performed. And there's a there are certain tiny hints, but posthumous hints that he played Adam, uh, the servant, uh, the old servant in As You Like It. That he played the ghost in Hamlet, but we don't know. He he apparently, it seems that he pulled back from performing uh, later uh, in his life, probably to to concentrate on his writing. We don't know in his room quietly what he thought about people in power or about uh, the religious claims. Was he primarily interested in a literary reputation or filling the theater? I think he was. Make, or making money? I think he didn't believe that they were alternative visions. I think he thought that making money, which he was very interested in, was bound up with uh, what his long-term life was afterlife would be. I think earlier in his life he thought that that poetry probably, lyric poetry would probably carry him forward and he wasn't famous, he was quite famous in his own time as a great lyric poet. Uh, but I think that as he developed as a playwright uh, he understood that his long-term prospects would be in the commercial theater and the, that there was no uh, gap, no division between doing well in the commercial theater and having uh, the life that's led to this conversation 400 years later. The book is called Shakespeare's Montaigne, the Florio Translations of the Essays, a selection edited by Stephen Greenblatt and Peter G. Platt. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Charlie. Pleasure to see you.